Hello, I hope everybody had a good weekend. Tonight we are going to cover Inter-Observer Agreement. This is more content from Chapter 6 of the APA Handbook of Behavior Analysis. Um, Inter-Observer Agreement is a term that we use to refer to the agreement between two or more observers. So in social science research or in behavior analytic research, we have to be concerned with the accuracy of our measurement because we are using human observers. So if a human is observing a client engaging in how to see behavior or self-injurious behavior or some form of an academic skill, while they're collecting their data, they may be prone to error. If they look away, they may miss a response or they may record a response that didn't actually occur. So in order to convey to the scientific community or the readers of our research, the, the reliability and accuracy of our data, we will report inter-observer agreement. And you'll learn more about it as we go through this lecture, but essentially it means that we have more than one observer recording every piece of data in a given study, and we compare their scores uh, in various ways. So <clears throat> we could uh, compare the total outcomes, or we could compare interval by interval. Did you record the same amount of data? So again, you'll see the different, different methodologies or different procedures for assessing IOA, and we'll discuss the, the strengths and limitations of each. But essentially what we're talking about here is taking a step to ensure that our measurement is accurate. And that's particularly important. So the textbook makes a distinction between some types of measurement, that is the observed values and the true value. Uh, and there's some long definitions to go along with these, but we'll, we'll sort of break it down uh, in a more simplistic term. So observed values are going to be values that result from observation and recording procedures used to collect data. So all of this really means for us in behavior analysis is the values that the data collector observed or what the data collectors see and record, whether they're recording on pen and paper or a uh, computer. The true value is defined as values resulting from a special observation and recording procedures that are different than those used to collect the data being evaluated and involves special efforts to minimize error. Um, <clears throat> now, in applied behavior analysis, true value be becomes kind of tricky because it relies on somebody observing, right? So it, it doesn't remove itself from observed values. Now, if, for example, we were um, observing a student typing keys on a keyboard, the computer could record true values, right? Because those would be different from what the observers are doing, right? The observers are observing the key presses and recording. The computer actually has uh, mechanisms within it to record each keystroke. So true value is okay there. So let's just, for the purposes of this lecture, consider that true values are values that represent what actually occurs. So if we had a device that could record each time a student struck his head with his hand mechanically, providing that device is working well, it would get a true value. An observer is going to get an observed value. Now, you might think, well, yeah, there, there probably is not going to be much difference between those two values. However, if the self-injurious behavior was very rapid and high frequency and difficult to count, then we might see a discrepancy between the true value and the observed value. So that's really what this chapter is going to focus on, is that our goal is obviously to approach the true value with our observed values, right? We want to make sure that the data has uh, some accuracy there. So the accuracy is going to be the extent to which the observed value matches the true state or the true value. That is, the observers are recording what actually has occurred. And for 
low frequency or easy to count behaviors, that's not a major concern. But when behaviors are difficult to record, accuracy can suffer, right? Accuracy can suffer for a variety of reasons, but uh, the, the frequency of behavior, high frequency behavior could be one, one of those reasons. Um, <clears throat> now, I mentioned some folks will use reliability and an inner observer agreement interchangeably. There is a difference. Reliability is going to be the stability of the relationship between observed values and events that actually occur. Uh, another way to phrase this would be the reliability of the observers, right? That is, they're, they're applying the same rules to record behaviors that they're observing consistently, right? They don't vary from observation to observation. If the observer, for example, utilized one operational definition to record a target behavior one day and slightly modified that operational definition the next day, then the reliability would suffer, right? The consistency of their measurement would, would be different, would vary across the two observations. <clears throat> uh, one of the, the, the examples I used to use, um, I think makes a good case. If you had a roller, um, most rollers are 12 inches. So if you apply that roller to measuring a variety of things like your desk, a piece of paper, a pencil, and so forth, it would have a consistent measurement, right? So reliability would be 100% because you're using that same device for each measurement. It's not going to vary. Um, if if also there was an error on that roller and instead of 12 inches, it read 12, but it was actually 11 and a half inches, the measurement would not be valid, but it would still be reliable because you're using that same faulty instrument to measure uh, different things in the environment. So validity and reliability are two different things. Okay, so we want reliable measurement always, right? We wanna make sure that our observers or ourselves, if we are the observer, are consistently measuring the behavior across repeated observations. Now, as I sort of alluded to uh, just now, validity is something a little different. Validity is gonna be the extent to which the observed values represent the events uh, as, that, that are supposed to be represented. Uh, to rephrase for our purposes, validity is going to be if we're applying a count measure to capture instances of self-injurious behavior, we want to make sure that measure of a count is valid, that, it, that it's capturing the dimension of behavior we want it to capture. When, when you're measuring validity of an instrument, uh, you may be interested in, does the instrument capture the specific uh, construct that you're measuring? So if you're, you're looking at something like uh, ego, right, if you're involved in counseling psychology, uh, there may be an instrument to measure that. Depression, right, that we, we kind of know what we mean by depression, but depression is really... Um, various behaviors that could be observed, but typically you'll use a testing instrument to measure depression. And you want to make sure that those uh, various questions on the instrument are valid, that they're actually capturing what we in the field of psychology know as depression. So there are a variety of uh, ways to determine validity and reliability of an instrument. For our purposes in behavior analysis, uh, validity is going to take on a slightly different meaning. 
And that is, if, in order for behavior to have validity, uh, we might say social validity, it means that we are measuring some behavior that has social significance. If a parent comes to us and their child's engaging in problematic behavior, uh, and that problematic behavior is aggression, we want to make sure that we are measuring aggression. Right? We, want, we don't want to measure something else like frustration because that is not a socially valid measure. That's not why the client is there. Measuring directly socially significant target behaviors. Measuring the appropriate dimension of a target behavior. Right. So again, I, I sort of indicated that um, just a few moments ago that if we're interested in, in the count of aggression or self-injury, we want to make sure that we capture that dimension appropriately. Um, th this probably becomes more important when you think of something like out of seat behavior. We can measure out of seat behavior each time the student leaves his or her chair as a count, we could, we could capture that. But if the target behavior, if getting up out of, out of the student's seat lasts for a specific duration of time, duration may be the more valid measure. So for example, if a student only gets out of their seat twice in a one hour period, but each time it's for 20 minutes, that's a more important dimension to capture. And I think we talked about that So that, that becomes important here for validity. And then we want to make sure that the data represented representative behaviors occurring under the conditions during which um, they are said to occur. So if um, when we're, we're determining our observation periods, which we discussed last week, if the teacher indicates, well, out of seat behavior mostly occurs in the afternoon, and you come to observe in the morning, maybe you capture a few um, occurrences at a certain duration in the morning, but it's not representative of when the problem mostly occurs. So those data would lack validity. We wanna make sure that we're approaching this issue of validity in sort of an ethical manner, that we're, we're, we're scheduling observations when they need to be scheduled, we're capturing the correct dimension of a behavior, and the behaviors we're interested in have some relevance, right, to the, the um, clinical well-being of the individual. Validity, accuracy, and reliability are relative concepts, meaning they range on a continuum from low to high, and we're always striving for high validity, accuracy, and reliability. When we have high validity, accuracy, and reliability, our data are more trustworthy. And that's important not only for research, because in order to be published, you have to have data that are trustworthy and believable, uh, but also in practice. We want to ensure that our data uh, are accurate, because if we're making clinical judgments based on data, whether to change an intervention, um, select a new intervention, or do anything related to treatment programming, we want to be confident that the data that we're using to make those decisions are accurate. Again, keep in mind that reliability and, and accuracy are on those continuums, and that reliable measurements could be inaccurate, right? I, I gave that example of using a faulty ruler to measure uh, a bunch of items. So we'll talk about this, this notion that um, your data collectors could be consistent, but they may be inaccurate in their data collection. So we need to make sure that they're trained well and that we're periodically checking in on them and so forth. We just may need to make sure that we're always in the higher range of those um, qualities of measurement. Now in natural sciences, when you wanna assess the accuracy of a measurement, you do so by comparing the observed values to the true values. And we, we know what the true values are, so I'm not gonna read that definition. But when we're observing human behavior, obtaining a true value becomes difficult. So when we can't 
we don't have access to true values, we rely on measures of inter-observer agreement to evaluate the quality of our data. And uh, that essentially is the consistency of an observational code or the extent to which um, the observation code produces the same results across samples. So our observation code includes um, the target behaviors, the dimension that we're measuring and so forth, and how we're how an observer is applying it to capture data in process as it's occurring. So the inner observer agreement calculations include total agreement, interval agreement, exact agreement, and proportional agreement or frequency within interval agreement. Um, and each of these have their own special formulas to calculate the coefficients. So if we look at total agreement first, when we're assessing total agreement, we're going to compare the overall session values obtained by two observers. And the formula would be the IOA coefficient is calculated by dividing the smaller value of the overall session value by the larger value. So in the uh, chart here, I have trials down the left-hand column, one through five, then the data collected by a primary observer and the data collected by a secondary observer. So these are two independent observers viewing the same participant and recording the data or the behaviors that they see. In this case, according to a trial format, so trial by trial. Um, so if we want to calculate total agreement, we simply add up all the responses observed by the primary and add up all the, the responses observed by the secondary. We get the totals and we divide the smaller by the larger. So in this case, the smaller would be 17 total responses divided by 18 total responses, which gives us 94%, which is relatively high. The, the flaw with this system, if you apply it to count or frequency data as we did here, is that you can see there are discrepancies, pretty significant ones, trial to trial, right? So here there's a discrepancy of five responses. Again, five, two, even though it's, this is low, one person's scored be behavior occurred twice where the other person didn't see it at all, right? So there's discrepancies here. Now, if we applied it to um, partial interval data where maybe we're just interested in the response occurring versus not occurring, total agreement would be fine. It's, it's typically uh, reserved for that type of data collection where we only wanna know uh, yes versus no, did the response occur? or correct versus incorrect. Another way to calculate data would be by using interval agreement. Now I want you to pay uh, close definitions to interval agreement as well as exact agreement because there's a slight distinction between them that uh, can trip you up on a quiz or an exam. So in interval agreement, we're gonna compare the individual data entries by two observers and scores agreements or disagreements. So the agreements or disagreements are gonna define by occurrence of behavior, not by the frequency. So even though we have frequency in here, we're not necessarily interested in that. We just wanna know, do they agree versus not agree? So in interval one, both observers agreed that behavior occurred. Interval two, they both agreed behavior occurred. Interval three, they both agreed. They agreed that behavior did not occur. Now that's an important qualification. It's, all, it, it's highlighting that the data collectors are uh, accurate in their responding and that they're both saying nothing occurred during interval three. Interval two, there's a disagreement. Right, one person scored behavior, the other person did not. And then interval five, agreement. So if we do those calculations, you have four out of five intervals with an agreement. So there's one, two, three, four agreements. 
divide it by the five intervals, and that gives you 80%. <clears throat> Sometimes you'll see the calculation expressed as the number of agreements divided by the number of agreements plus disagreements. So again, with this method of calculation, you could see that there is discrepancy between the two observers. So we're again only interested in whether or not behavior occurred. So if we apply this to, again, partial interval data, probably okay. Uh, frequency data, not the most conservative uh, assessment for IOA. So uh, what else can I say about this? Uh, again, just keep in mind that agreements are scored in under this arrangement. Agreements are scored when both data collectors indicated behavior was observed. There is also an agreement when they agree that behavior did not occur. The only time you have a disagreement is when one observer recorded behavior and the other one did not. So a more conservative measure of <clears throat> agreement scores would be exact agreement. So this would apply to frequency data. And uh, same data streams by two observers. But in this case, we're going to score an agreement if the both observers scored the exact same frequency. All right, so the, compare the frequencies entered by two observers and scores exact agreements. So in interval one, there is a disagreement because the scores are not exact. Interval two, a disagreement. Interval one, there is an agreement. And intervals four and five are disagreements. So if we calculated these, this IOA, it would be one divided by five, which gives you 20%. <clears throat> so a very conservative measure. In fact, I would say overly conservative because even though there's a pretty significant discrepancy here, both observers did record some behavior that seemed to correspond across each of them. Um, maybe they should get partial credit, right? I think as college students, you could probably appreciate partial credit. And for data collectors, same thing. So the next method, frequency within intervals or proportional agreement, does just that. So this is probably the more complex um, formula out of all of them, but it is really quite simple as long as you kind of attend to the example here. So here, we're going to compare the frequencies entered by two observers and score proportional agreements. What that means is when we look at the data stream, and what I mean by data stream is the uh, observation across time, we are going to calculate the proportion between the two observers. So in interval one, the primary scored 10, the secondary it scored five. So we're gonna calculate that smaller divided by larger. Five divided by 10 gives you 50.50. Same thing here, 0.50. When both scores agree, it's going to be a one, right? 100%, so even if it's a zero. So in this case, zero and a zero are calculated as a one. Here, um, it's zero, zero divided by two, zero, and one divided by two, 50%. So then we add those up, 0.50 plus 0.50 plus 1.00 plus zero plus 0 0.50 gives you 2.5. You take that total of the smaller divided by the larger, so here are the sum of the smaller versus larger, divided by the total number of intervals, which is five in this example. <clears throat> so 50%. Okay, here's um, just another example of data streams. And this looks like something that, that came out of the textbook um, with a few more uh, examples included. So here, we have the number of intervals going across the top, one through 10, data collected by observers one and observer two, and the different calculations below. So the plus sign in this first example would be um, 
partial interval data, right? Behavior occurred versus not occurred. So total agreement here would simply be adding up the pluses, six for observer one, five for observer two, and calculating the uh, smaller divided by the larger, which gives you 83%. Uh, interval agreement would be scoring whether or not there is agreements in each interval. So here, both observe in interval one, both observers <clears throat> agreed that there is behavior observed. Interval two, the same thing. So there's an agreement, disagreement, and four, disagreement, and five, a disagreement, six, and seven, they agreed that behavior did not occur. And then no more agreements. So there we have three divided by the 10 intervals gives you 30%. On the second half of this panel, um, now we have frequency data included for each observer. And we could apply interval agreement, exact agreement, or proportional agreement, or, or total agreement for that matter. So <clears throat> we'll go through all of them. Um, I'm not gonna call out the values, but you could see that if you total up the number of behaviors from observer one, it comes to 19 and observer to 18. So come down here to total agreement, 18 divided by 19 gives you 94.7%. If you apply the interval agreement, <clears throat> that is both observers agreed, agreed that behavior occurred versus did not occur, then you have an agreement for every interval. Right, so 10 divided by 10 gives you a 100% uh, inner observer agreement. Exact agreement is a little more conservative. So in interval one, there's an exact agreement between the two observers. Interval two, there is an exact agreement. Interval three, there is not, right? So you could square that as a disagreement. Interval four, there is disagreement disagreement, agreement, agreement, disagreement, and agreement. So we count up the agreements, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six divided by 10 gives you 60%. Moving on to proportional agreement, uh, again, smaller divided by larger for each interval. So when they're the same, it is a one. We have a one here. 2 divided by 3, it's a 1. 3 divided by 4, 1 divided by 3, 1, 1, 2 divided by 3, and 3, <clears throat> that's a 1. So if you do these calculations and you add up the proportions, you get 8.42 divided by the 10 intervals gives you 84.2% IOA. So those are the calculations. Again, just to reiterate, total agreement and interval agreement is probably most appropriate for partial interval styles of data. Yes or no data, correct, incorrect, things of that nature. Um, all of them can apply to frequency type of data, but it's probably best to use a more conservative measure. So something like exact agreement versus proportional agreement. By and large, if you look at um, studies published in Java, you will see most, most researchers are using proportional agreement, right? Because you should get credit, partial credit for um, some accuracies in the data collection. So those are your different calculations. Uh, I will include a secondary exercise uh, that, that I'll review in a lecture just so you can practice these before doing the quiz or the exam, because there will be questions like this on the quiz and exam. <clears throat> so what are the benefits of inter-observer agreement? Well, first and foremost, it increases our confidence in the data, right? Whether we are a researcher or a consumer of the research or, or a practitioner, this is important. As a researcher, I need to make sure my data are accurate, um, therefore I should assess IOA frequently such that I convince the reviewers 
that my data are accurate and that the analysis is uh, valid. If, uh, if my, my study is published, I need to make sure the IOA scores are good because I want the consumers of that research to have trust in the data that are published. So that, that's sort of one, one area. In practice, I wanna make sure that my data are accurate because I'm making decisions based on these data. And if my data are not accurate, I'm making decisions inappropriately, right? Because the data are not reflecting what's happening uh, out there. So very important, not just in research, we need IOA in practice, but uh, I will venture to say at this point, you probably see it less in practice. Why? Because it's a resource issue. Um, if most of you are working in schools, you probably don't have a, an assistant to help you collect data as you are collecting data. Uh, or in a classroom, you probably don't have two data collectors. In um, in-home services, again, same issue. You don't always have two data collectors. I will say, however, in special education schools or those who are uh, providing ABA services, specialized ABA services like the Princeton Child Development Institute or EPIC or um, <clears throat> any of these, these renowned services for individuals with autism, they probably do collect, in fact, I know they assess IOA, right? Because again, you wanna make sure that your programming is high quality. And one way to do that would be to ensure that all data collectors are reliable data collectors and accurate data collectors. So it's worth it to assess IOA. Uh, another thing I could say about that is, Imagine if you're consulting to a classroom and the teacher's aide is recording data for you, right? So you're not in the classroom all the time. Uh, therefore, you need somebody to capture those data while you're not there. And you come to get those data, graph them and make decisions. You wanna make sure that you can trust those data. So one thing you might do periodically is just pop into the classroom for a brief moment and collect data simultaneously with that data collector. And then you could compare the two scores and see if they are still accurately collecting data as you would. So we'll talk about that. Uh, increases in behavioral outcomes, right? So if we produce an outcome, whether in a client or an organization or anything like that, uh, if the IOA is good, we're confident that the, the observed changes or the observed outcomes um, are true. Determines the competence of observers. I think I talked about that uh, briefly. <clears throat> and then detect observer drift. This was something that was mentioned in the last chapter. I always save it for this chapter because it seems a little more appropriate. But uh, we'll talk about some of the threats to accuracy uh, shortly. So again, how do you choose a system? Um, it really depends on the behavior being observed and the behavior change and the, the way you're measuring behavior. So as I mentioned, trial-based data, like correct, incorrect, yes, no, plus, minus, total agreement or interval agreement are fine systems. Frequency-based data, you should probably use exact agreement or proportional agreement. How often should we collect inner observer agreement and what is a good score? Um, I don't believe there are explicit rules for doing this, but some journals have certain standards. Um, and, and I know in my training and general practice, uh, I've used the values that are depicted here. So, or the parameters rather. So IOA should be assessed during each condition or phase of a study, or in practice, if you have the ability, e each phase or condition. So what I mean there is in baseline, there should be some sessions with an observer agreement as well as treatment. So the requirement isn't that you have a secondary observer 100% of the time, but a subset of your observation should have a secondary observer. Should be distributed equally across days, weeks, and times. And here are the, the values. 
it should be obtained for a minimum of 20% of all sessions or observations. Between 25 to 33% is preferred. So if I conducted a study and I only had IOA for 10 sessions um, and there were 100 sessions, that, that, that's not a particularly good practice, right? I'd want to have IOA for, for more. So we just need to make sure that we keep up, keep it above 20%. The coefficient score should really be no less than 80%, right? So that means um, each time we assess IOA, the score should be at 80, or at least the mean of all the scores should be at 80. So we might have some observations with lower IOA, but as long as the average is 80, we're good. So I'd say 80 or above is a good uh, IOA coefficient. If we're involved in research and we uh, there's a requirement to report IOA, so when we report IOA, you, you, if you look through Java, you'll see sort of this, this standard um, way of, of describing how IOA was assessed and what the scores were. So typically you're gonna have the percentage of observations that had IOA, that'll be reported. The method for calculating IOA should be reported and um, your agreement scores. So I'll read this brief passage, um, but again, you can look at any article in Java and you'll see something equivalent to this. <clears throat> Inter-observer agreement was assessed during 39% of the sessions by having a second observer simultaneously but independently collect data with a primary observer. Sessions were partitioned into consecutive 10 second intervals and observer records were compared on an interval by interval basis. The smaller number of responses in each interval was divided by the larger number of responses. These proportions were averaged across intervals and multiplied by 100%. The mean agreement score was 98%. The range was 92 to 100%. So again, you can see it has all these elements where we're describing how frequently IOA was assessed, how it was assessed, and the formula that was used as well as the scores with the range. We always put the range in. So if the mean were, um, say, 85%, but in the range you saw scores as low as 60, that might be concerning to um, you as a reviewer. So th that's sort of the, the basics that come out of the textbook for IOA, but one of the things that that sort of goes overlooked is the fact that if we are not the ones collecting data, we are using somebody else to collect our data for us. And we need to train those people. Training not only includes reviewing the target behaviors and operational definitions, as well as a method for collecting data, but you may have them practice data collection before you allow them to ca capture data on their own. Right, so you could practice collecting data in a variety of ways. When I was in graduate school, we had developed a training video and it got uh, increasingly more difficult to collect data and it allowed student data collectors, these are undergraduates, to practice data collection and become reliable with observing, right? So if they were reliable on the video, they could begin to collect data in experiments and so forth. And, and we continue to assess their, their inner observer agreement. But nevertheless, you could train them via video during observations and you're simply comparing records. So if I were an independent consultant and I was utilizing a teacher's aid to collect data, I would spend part of my consultation sitting down with that person, reviewing the target behavior, operational definitions, and how we're collecting data, how we're using the data sheet. And then I would rec I would collect data and have them observe me. Then I would have them collect data and I would observe them making corrections as we go. 
And then maybe I would have a, an observation where we independently collect data and I compare the two records to make sure that they are collecting it with the same accuracy as myself. So training is important. Okay, so if we train uh, individuals up and we're, we're often running with their data collection, um, nothing bad can happen, right? Well, that, there can be some things that, that are problematic and that would be threats to validity and threats to accuracy of data collection. Um, threats to validity would probably be ironed out earlier in this process. We wouldn't be collecting data if we didn't think it was valid. But um, you know, as I indicated earlier, we wanna make sure that we're capturing the correct dimension of a behavior. If we're not, it may be a threat to the validity. So I, I have some examples here, but again, I think the, the better example is out of seat behavior, right? It may occur at a low frequency, but if the duration is extensive, duration is the better measure. <clears throat> Measurement artifacts are threats to validity, right? That is data being misleading due to how we're measuring it. So if you consider something like whole interval versus partial interval, we know they are estimates and that's not a problem, but they're, they can overestimate or underestimate it. So that, that is an artifact of those measurement systems that, that are a threat to validity, right? It doesn't sort of uh, invalidate those data, but we know they're not 100% accurate because they are estimates. Poorly scheduled observations could be another threat. Um, if you're using a, a, a rating scale, Maybe it's insensitive or limited in some way. <clears throat> if we consider threats to both accuracy and reliability, um, one could be poorly designed measurement systems or cumbersome or complex measurement systems. When we talked about creating data sheets, I mentioned this, and that is if we are recording more than three or four behaviors or requiring an observer to record three or more behaviors, the data collection becomes more cumbersome and complex. Or if we're capturing two, uh, two target behaviors using a frequency, one using a duration and another one using partial interval recording, that's a complex system of data collection and that could be a threat to the accuracy of those data. And that is simply, uh, Gathering the data in all those different formats is overwhelming for an observer. Therefore, they may make mistakes or they're prone to make mistakes. <clears throat> Poor observer selection and training could also be a threat to accuracy. So again, you need to train your observers in order to have them um, collecting data accurately and reliably. Other threats to accuracy include observer drift, this is probably um, most common in the area of behavior analysis. So that is the observer uh, changes the way they apply the measurement over time, right? Whether it be by including behaviors that were observed but are not part of the operational definition or um, something related to that. So for example, if self-injury includes open hand to head and suddenly the individual scratches their head, if the data collector records that, it's not part of the definition. So the way they applied the definition has drifted and that is a threat to, to uh, the accuracy of the data. Observer expectations, again, not too problematic in behavior analysis. You, you probably recall this from <clears throat> um, experimental methods as an undergrad where observers expect something to happen. They expect an effect, therefore they record something. Um, I could see this potentially occurring if there's high frequency behavior and you're you know, counting each one, one, two, three, four, and you expect more to occur, but it suddenly stops and you record a couple extra instances. Observer reactivity could also affect your accuracy and reliability simply um, when you come in as a supervisor to observe people collecting data, they may react to you being present and make mistakes. <clears throat>